I'm not actually going to be too technical. I'm, I'm still looking at it from the business perspective. So it's only when you hear um, Andrew and Xiao Bin that it will really get technical. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about um, for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, ISO 2146, the standard that our scheme is based on, um, and a bit about how it works, what's in it, and how it can be used to share metadata with ANS. Uh, we've already talked about this, obviously. Uh, this is our goal, a great big global commons with information and data in it. Um, we're mostly interested in the data part. And how we're doing it at the moment is by sharing metadata. Okay, well, uh, the reason that we have a little model here is that I was asked to do a uh, draft up a first information model for ANS, which uh, as yet is still a work in progress. Um, but this was where I started. So inputs, activity, outputs, which is like modelling 101 type thing, system design 101. Um, I thought this is really our, our focus, what we're interested in. Um, this, on the other hand, is, is Sally's personal picture of the ISO 2146 information model. Um, it's, as you can see, got four main entities that that standard says that they're, they're interested in, which I'll tell you what they are. <laughs> um, so you can see down there there's the collection, which is our key focus. Um, the activity that, hap that caused the collection to happen, so that would be like a program, a project. Uh, the parties, the people or organisations involved with either the activities or the collections and the services, <coughs> excuse me, through which the collections um, become available. So those four entities are um, described in that standard um, which ANS has used as the basis for our schema. Um, I think, and it's very important to notice the arrows between them. Those relationships are the most important part of this schema, from I think, from from one perspective. Um, and the reason this this model was chosen was, uh, and we've heard heard people talk about their particular discipline projects, their data capture projects. Um, every single one of those will have either some discipline specific way of organising information, or else it will have some custom one or some proprietary one, depending what software they have. Um, there's lots of, of standards as well for in organising metadata. Um, we've heard some mention of some of those. So there was SDMX in the statistical world, um, DDI in social sciences. Uh, Dublin Core's used a lot in library type and archives areas. Um, obviously, ANS can't possibly accommodate every single one of those specific schemas and, and methods of organising information. So what we needed was something that could uh, lie across the top and extract what it needed from those other ones, but without replicating them. Uh, and so this was the standard that we went with. Um, and in this little picture, which I hope you can see, um, I've tried to take my uh, system design 101, the three green bits, and sort of munge them in with the red bits which came from the ISO 2146 standard. So uh, you can see our, our research activity and their activity fit together. Uh, their collections and our research outputs roughly fit together if we've redefined that slightly. Um, where we run into a few sort of grey areas are in the research inputs which aren't really going to fit themselves neatly into the ISO 2146 um, information model and you could see up on the top left there the public sector administrative data sets. Um, obviously the, the government, the public sector creates a lot of data for itself for its own purposes. They're not actually always doing research although sometimes they do. Um, if they do do research it fits down there in the green bits but if they've got data that's not been done for a research purpose but for an administrative purpose um, that's still of interest to researchers in Australia. So uh, ANS does have a program of, of trying to describe that sort of data. Uh, so that's that top orange one. Um, other, to other research inputs have also come up as things that people would like us to be able to describe, um, specifically the instruments that are generating a lot of data 
at the data capture end. Um, another issue that's come up, uh, and I think was even mentioned a bit today, analytical tools, um, derived data sets, things that are happening inside that research activity box. Um, from our perspective, they're not exactly outputs and they're not exactly collections. Um, so where they exactly do fit, I don't really quite know, and that's my unofficial view. Um, in some ways, they could possibly be seen as services, and Nick's been doing a bit of work on uh, looking at what the exact scope of a service might be, um, whether some of those things could fit in there. Um, so most of those orange bits, except the public sector data, doesn't really fit in my sort of unofficial information model. But certainly the, the research activity and research outputs in, the, in terms of data certainly do. So I just thought I'd um, spell out the standard name there. You can see that the standard that we've based our schema on it was not originally directly focused on our current focus, so we've had to adapt it and, in, and implement um, a schema that focuses specifically on our requirements rather than implement that standard exactly as it is. Um, so if you go to that standard, you'll see it's extremely generic, so it doesn't really describe exactly what we're doing. But the, the links between the entities is one of the most important aspects. Um, RIFCS, which, as we said, stands for Registry Interchange Format Collections and Services. Uh, it's an XML schema. And uh, it's not uh, a model that you would probably want to use for a data store. It's more stuff that has to come out of the data store, that's the format we want it to come to us in. A bit blurry. Um, that uh, should be okay in your um, packs anyway. Shows the four entities again, collection, service, party and activity, and all the different kinds of relations that can be described between them. Um, this is really the major benefit that over this schema rather than using something like Dublin Core. Uh, which would not allow us to describe all these relationships in this way. Um, so I'm, uh, I should tell you more about what they are, I suppose. So collections we talked about earlier, um, research data collections. They might be images, they could be fossils, they could be mud cores, um, anything that's of value for research, but not publications. Um, we have Activities, as we said, projects, programs, courses of study. We have parties, that would be researchers, it could be universities, research institutions, and we have services. Um, originally implemented by Anne's thinking primarily of web services, but as I said, we've got Nick looking at exactly how that should work best for us in the future. And I guess our basic scenario that we are attempting to describe would be that a researcher gets funded by a funding organisation to do some particular project. Uh, they carry out that project within some research institution. Um, out, out the end comes a big pile of data and probably a publication. Um, and then the collection becomes available through some, some service. And so we want to be able to describe all of the things that happen in that uh, scenario. And we'd want to also be able to link off to the publication, although we ourselves aren't describing that. Okay, our interchange schema is just basically um, a, a little pile of metadata describing an object. So the object might be a collection, a party, an activity, or a service. Um, Monica will talk to us in a minute about the whole party description thing. Um, Originally, that was designed into our system to be described within our system. Uh, it's now looking like there'll be a far, a far more uh, difficult to describe <laughs> an extended way of um, describing parties that also involves the National Library doing authority control work and so on. Um, Monica will tell us all about it. Um, and this is the basic metadata that we, we're collecting. Um, which your systems are going to have to be able to push out the end if, if you're going to give us the discovery metadata we want. Um, so the name of the thing, its identifiers, um, any locations that are relevant, could be addresses, 
um, the location of a metadata record, the location of a data set, um, very important relations with other kinds of entities as described by their metadata records, uh, spatial and temporal coverage and subject, uh, which are extremely important for discovery and will also, especially the, the spatial coverage, I think be very important for trying to link data sets together in the future. Uh, and good descriptions including rights information, so copyright or any other rights that apply. Um, and links to related information such as publications. Now obviously some of that would have to be manually created. Some of it might come out of the project proposals that people put in when they get their funding. Um, there's, there's quite a few sources for that information but it's still a bit of a trick to bring it all into one space. Um, we also need a bit of metadata Inform information about the metadata record itself, um, group which we use for display purposes in Research Data Australia, a key which obviously is pretty critical because that's the, the thing that identifies the metadata record so that when you harvest um, it can replace the old one with the new one uh, and a few bits of information to tell us a bit about the record itself, where it came from, and how old it is, what's happened to it. I can also just met, uh, constrain the information by saying what language it's in or dates from and to that it was valid from. It's all pretty standard stuff. Um, and then because it's an XML schema, there's also a couple of elements to do with, this, with defining the structure of the information within the document. Um, so you think of XML as a big document, has a thing to mark the start and the end and then within it it's got the individual records which also have to have starts and ends and I'll show you that it, um, when I do the Research Data Australia demo a bit later. Um, one of the first things that has to happen uh, if RIFCS is going to be provided to ANS is that somebody's got to sit down and look at what um, metadata you've already got and map it to what we want to have. Um, and this document here, which is on our website, tells you about the semantics of all the elements and the vocabularies. Um, this is where we're going to keep updating all the, the guidelines about how the vocabulary should be applied. Um, and there would be a full web version, except I haven't quite finished it yet. So at the moment it's uh, available as a PDF. But I'm, I'm very hopeful that it's close. Um, furthermore, um, our schema, which has been stable for about two years, is, is now about to undergo some minor enhancements. Um, the spatial and temporal coverage used to be in with the addresses. It's going to have its own element. Uh, the related information element that just lets you point to a, something outside, it will now also have um, fields that let you say what it is that you're pointing to. So say you're pointing out to PubMed or something, it's, it'll, you'll be able to say a publication. Um, we'll have a new citation element so that you can put a full citation in for the data set and that ties in with what Nick was talking to us about earlier, the citation and the DOIs. Um, and we sort of are aware of course that by changing the schema we're changing what people who've already implemented the schema have to do at their end and so we've got a, a lot of transitional arrangements in place um, and our website's got a whole lot of information about that. Um, the whole question of how the schema should be changed and who's, who's allowed to say that it should change and so on, um, we've had a lot of people who want to be involved in that process and Anne's is in the process of setting up um, an advisory board that will bring in all the community input into that process. Um, the basic um, sh schedule is that we would only change it annually, not willy-nilly all over the place because we realise people have to schedule and plan and allocate resources and so on. Um, but I think it's probably reasonable to say that an the, the schema as it was originally developed uh, was uh, sort of not a, not exactly a prototype but it wasn't as much informed by experience as it is now so as we get a lot of people starting to use it including you people um, it's quite likely that the model will need to ad adapt and so therefore the schema will as well. 
Um, here's a nice pictorial version of um, what actually happened. So you can see in the middle there's our ANS Collections Registry, our database. Um, I should have done a server picture, but that's what we got. Um, Research Data Australia, our portal, um, looks, looks at that for its information. Um, and then down the bottom there's three ways that this RIFCS yes information is getting into our database. Um, so over on the left, yes, the left, um, publish my data, which is a, a, for individual researchers, um, particularly if you had people who were at the end of their career and had to do something straight away. Um, our preference, however, is to use the things over on the right-hand side, um, which are institution-based. Uh, obviously, we'd much rather deal with you know, 50 research institutions than 100,000 researchers and their chances of getting good quality stuff out is much greater as well. Um, so on the institutional side there's either the machine to machine service or there's also the, the manual data entry option which Andrew referred to earlier um, and th that's also available in our sandbox environment for you to play with and probably break. <laughs> no, you won't break it, trust me. Um, I'm, I'm only looking at this from a business perspective, so I apologise to the people that are technical because this is obviously something you already know. Um, I created this little picture of how <laughs> harvesting works for ANS because I, I was trying to understand the log entries and error messages that I kept getting when I tried to do stuff and work out what was going on. Um, so over on the left you've got our data source where you've got, you've got a little data source administrator sitting there. That data source administrator is the person who determines the whole harvesting process, when it will happen, what will be harvested and by what methods. Um, so that person configures it. Um, that's step one. Step two, that our uh, database instructs the harvester according to whatever the data source administrator told it. The harvester application goes away, gets the metadata from over, back over there, um, takes it back to ANS, then it inserts that metadata into the registry database uh, from which Research Data Australia is fed. Um, so error messages that I was trying to interpret came from each of these six places. <laughs> but I think it's still it's quite helpful to see that the data source administrator controls the harvesting process. Um, and this here is the basic process of setting up the feed at a, at, from a business level, obviously. Um, and where you people are all working is way back here on the left, way to the left before this arrow even starts, really, because you've, first of all, we're assuming there is metadata, and that's really where you, you are. Um, once there is metadata, it has to be mapped, turned into a RIFCS, um, exposed for the harvester to get it um, and then get inserted into the registry and made discoverable. Um, so this probably is not the perfect slide for you guys because I should have another box at the left which says arrange to capture data and metadata. Um, ANS has various services for um, helping you to provide us with this RIFCS XML. Um, register my data as I just discussed before, register my data is for the, ma the machine level and publish my data is more for the individuals. The identifying services that Nick described and we also have a whole lot of web services that you can use to um, work with your metadata records. And here's some links which will obviously be in your packs. How am I going? Fast? Okay. Um, so that's, that's the end of that question. Oh, does anybody want to ask me anything? <laughs>